Thank you. Thanks, Ross. Right. Thank you. I'd also like to. Sorry. I'd also like to acknowledge the work of Nunawal Kamilaroi custodian and artist Richie Allen. Here, three rivers, Yas, Malongolo, and Murrumbidgee. Richie Allen shows the Murrumbidgee as a big water, an important, strong part of the landscape that connects places and people. This big water is now a river whose health is significantly compromised, and this adversely affects its cultural, economic, social, and environmental values. However, it's not too late to address this, but we need major transformative changes to the way the river's governed, managed, and used. And we also need to celebrate it more so that future generations do have a sustainable river. I thank Rodney for giving Andy and I our chance to come here today. And what we're going to do is to share with you the nature of the problems that confront the upper Murrumbidgee River. We're going to outline ideas on how these might be tackled. And we're going to explain how we are connecting with so many others so that together and through everyone's own individual actions, we might be able to foster the needed transformative changes so that this forgotten river does not remain forgotten. And I particularly now want to thank all those who have been and continue to take care of the river and seek support for transformational changes. We hope our presentation encourages you to take action to help protect the Forgotten River. I'm having a stubborn moment here. No, no, we're having a frozen moment. Try now. Sometimes when you go. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Uh, the waters of the upper Murrumbidgee River start in the fiery range of the Snowy Mountains from where the river flows southwards to Cooma before turning northwards through the ACT to reach Burrinjuk Dam. The waters of the upper Murrumbidgee River are locally, regionally and nationally important as they're part of the southern basin of the Murray-Darling Basin. While the waters are significant and Murrumbidgee even means big water in Wiradjuri, as you'll hear today, Sorry. As I'll put that down, which might help. As you'll hear today, it does not mean the upper Murrumbidgee River is necessarily big in considerations that ultimately affect it. To draw attention to this, the Murrumbidgee wrote a letter to Canberrans through a ghostwriter, and he happens to be here on my left, Andy. Um, and the river said. I thank the Murrumbidgee River for speaking out that it said, I'm writing this letter as a record of what has been an unusual and remarkable year for me and the people of the region. I've seen a lot in my life, but this year, this year um, has taken, is one for the books. I started December 2019 looking up to the grand old Brindabellas covered in snow. It was a cold one to start the summer indeed, but a chill that was soon to be replaced by oppressive heat gusting warm winds and bushfires. Three consecutive hot and dry years had baked the country. In the middle of December, I finally stopped flowing. As we geared towards Christmas, water was trucked into the township of Thara and the cod, yellow belly and crayfish, which rely on my water, took refuge in the remaining stagnant pools to await the returning flow of water. January 2020, was not a pleasant one for me or the region, but one week in January was a real shocker. I'm of course referring to the week from Monday the 20th to Monday the 27th. On the 20th of January, 2020, I watched as a powerful storm rolled in from the Northwest and dropped a belting of hail over the city. For those watching from a distance, it was spectacular. From those underneath, absolutely terrifying. By nightfall on Monday the 27th, the Aurora Valley bushfire would just be starting to consume Namaji National Park. For me, this was the saddest part of the year as I watched 80% of the National Park and the animals within it destroyed. The return of rain is celebrated, but this joy was a mixed blessing for the river. February saw the coming of the first decent rain for a while and boy did the countryside need it. I'll never complain of the rain coming down, but the first rains after a fire are not pleasant. 
I was now getting a dose of what Canberra had been breathing in all summer. My waters turned as black as Guinness and with ash and burnt timber washing into my body and filling my throat and lungs. I'm not sure if it is possible to have varying shades of black, but in February 2020, the Gudjumbri River, just upstream of Thawa, turned a shade of black I'll never forget. While it was not pleasant, the return of running water was just what I needed after a long, hot and dry spell. And thankfully, it was a sign of things to come. In the letter, the river reflects on its history, saying it has seen a lot from watching how First Nation people lived as one with the landscape, through to seeing and feeling the effects of the early European occupation, to being aware of the development of nearby suburbs. It also shares how incredibly important it was for people to visit during COVID. Finally, it makes a call for help. I'm a little anxious, it says, for what the future holds. Unfortunately, I'm not as healthy as I should be, and I do wonder about what the future has in store. What does a warming climate mean for the waters? What does Snowy 2.0 mean? I've heard of all these things. I don't know, but as I have done for years, I'll patiently sit by and find out. I may need a few more of you to keep an eye out for me. So the question for us is why? Why has this occurred? Is it because of our changing climate? Or is it because people simply don't care about the big water? Or is it because um, their policies that are in place are inappropriate? Or do water management practices need changing? Or do we need more people aware of the importance of this river and what it's going through? Well, to varying degrees, it's all those things. Our collective head, heart and hands are absolutely not connected when it comes to the Forgotten River. Decades ago, policies to support the Snowy Hydro Scheme resulted in transformative changes in the flows to the upper Murrumbidgee. And Andy's got an excellent um, image of this. Its natural water flows were, were dramatically and permanently reduced. And that's an important message, permanently and dramatically reduced. Then over the decades, water management practices have compounded this situation. Also, for many, it's completely out of sight and completely out of mind, so not in many folks' heart and heads. Tragically, this has resulted in its sustainability being tenuous, and it is, it is the Forgotten River as a result. While all these challenges are complex and new transformative changes are absolutely needed, which will be a challenge to achieve given people are responding, some people are responding to the river's cry for help. People have been helping in many ways in both government and non-government sectors through sharing of information that raises awareness, through professional research and policy analysis that puts the facts out there, and there's been a fair bit of restoration activities uh, and modifying the river where people can through land management practices. And while these responses have involved many people using their head, heart and hands, many, many more head, heart and hands are needed and would be welcome. And this is because we are really dealing with one of the big wicked problems of our time. It's complex and absolutely no easy solution. For example, governance is complex. Um, jurisdictional overlap, historical legal arrangements, competing priority. It's also a problem that is best solved by an interdisciplinary approach in which people with ecological skills and knowledge such as yourselves play a pivotal role. Ecological knowledge is critical to finding the sustainable solutions. We're fortunate that there are many partnerships, uh, formal and informal, that can be used to bring people together. This includes partnerships fostered by the ARC that Andy um, works with, and also by the group I work with, the ACT Catchment Management Coordination Group, which is a, a group across the region. Partnerships are important. The coordination group has a formal governance structure that fosters partnerships and provides a forum for raising and cooperatively trying to address these kinds of issues. It was established uh, quite visionary, I think, in the AC under ACT legislation in 2007 to advise the ACT Minister for Water, currently Minister Rattenbury, who is also Minister for Energy and Emission Reductions, and that's important, as you'll see. Importantly to note, Minister Rattenbury is on the Murray-Darling Basin Commission Ministerial Council, and we know um, from our engagement with him, he's actively working on this issue to raise awareness, and he's calling for policy change. 
The coordination group comprises senior executives from the ACT and New South Wales government and adjacent New South Wales local government bodies, the National Capital Authority, Icon Water, and we have a community rep. We're also working towards having a First Nation rep. The group's remit facilitates it advocating for better policies and practices to protect the river, and that's just what we've been doing. Uh, the coordination has groups made several submissions to New, New South Wales and Commonwealth bodies to raise awareness about the plight of the river's health. Our submissions are founded on scientific information. For example, in relation to the water sharing plan, New South Wales one, we our submission talked about minimum base flows, conditions not being preserved to support longitudinal connectivity, which has led to river reaches becoming disconnected and ceasing to flow, native fish populations being heavily impacted, poor water quality, and so our submission went on. Addressing the Upper Murray River requires addressing many issues, including finding an answer to, and this to me is the fundamental question, how to generate renewable hydro energy and still have a sustainable river. To this end, our submission to the Natural Resource Commission asked them to consider the effect of the snowy water license as an external influence on the environmental, social and cultural objectives of the water sharing plan and how to highlight and advance the considerations of unmitigated risks and opportunities for investigation through the current snowy license review. However, submissions alone are not going to scratch it. Therefore, given this and the fact that the ACD government has virtually no direct power to redress the Upper Murrumbidgee's wicked problems, I've joined with Andy and many others, formally and informally, in having discussions with community leaders, um, community members and decision making makers, which includes, as I mentioned, politicians from the ACT, our Minister for Water, to foster the actions that need to occur to address this situation. Before handing over to Andy, I really love this image and I wish to emphasise the importance of striving for sustainability, as difficult as it is. This image shows the work of Wiradjuri artist Jordana Angus, representing the 17 SD Sustainable Development Goals adopted by Australia as one of the 193 nations that agreed to the UN's Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It emphasises the importance of connections and I think working in an interdisciplinary way, understanding and using connections, whether in physical natural systems or in communities or in governance or in management or all of these together is central to advancing the sustainability of the Upper Murrumbidgee. Significantly in this image, what I really love is the partnership SDG forms the Western boundary and governance the Eastern one thereby appearing to hold all the other SDGs firmly aligned and together. To me, partnerships and governance are the bookends for sustainability. And you've probably seen this quote many times, but I think it's powerful. Um, you know, we know the future is not someplace we're going. It's actually something we're creating. Our forefathers created the future and our foremothers and our four days created the future we're currently in. Um, you know, and the thing that's often not mentioned in this quote is the second part, the paths that are not to be found but made and the activity of making these changes both the maker and the destination. So we get changed by what we do to change what we want to have happen. May future history report the collective effort of people using their heads, hearts and hands ultimately found a ways to support the Upper Murrumbidgee being sustainable. I'm now going to hand over to Andy. Andy. Andy, before I do, I'll, I'll use this one. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Max. Uh, thanks, Max. And thanks, Rod, for the opportunity uh, to speak here. So, yeah, I'm uh, Andy Lowe's from the Australian River Restoration Centre. Uh, and the Upper Murrumbidgee Catchment Network. And uh, I'm a Canberra uh, born and bred local. Uh, this is Point Hut just down the road from me. Uh, and this photo was taken back in 2019, just after the resumption of the first flows after the river dried up. Uh, I'm a proud south sider of Canberra. So I live out of Gordon. And, uh, oh, that hasn't, oh, give me up. I need to change me, that's the one. 
And uh, I guess growing up born and, born and bred Canberran, like all our time was spent down at the river. And so that's me about to jump off the rock uh, with a goofy look on my face. That's my brother Simon behind me who actually took those photos of the dry riverbed that you saw. And I'm glad he did get out and, and take those photos. My cousin Dan over from Adelaide and my sister there hanging out in the water. We, we, this is the only photo we found in the family of us in the river. And I asked mum and dad, I said, well, where's all the other photos? And they said, well, that wasn't a holiday. That was just going to the river. All our photos are down the coast when we went down the coast. So uh, I also asked, what's the go with the shoes on the rocks there? And no one can explain that. But anyway, I guess growing up as kids, you know, we were down there all the time, uh, yabbing, fishing, swimming, throwing the air mattress in, uh, just hanging out. And it was really great. And I think that's where my love of sort of Australian rivers came from. And then I then went on to study right here at UC. So this is a bit of a blast from the past for me coming back here. I uh, haven't really been back for since 2008, maybe once or twice. But after graduating from the University of Canberra, I then went into a couple of federal government agencies, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and the Commonwealth Environmental Water Office. And uh, much of the focus, so over the last decade of working there, was delivering what's called environmental water or environmental flows or water for the environment. Same thing, three different names, but it's water that's set aside in our dams to actually care for the rivers itself. And so with both these roles with the Commonwealth and the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, um, I don't know, if, can I get the pointer off? Is that, is that an option? Uh, here we are, just for those online as well. You know, and, and the water that's being recovered for the environment, we can actually do some really cool things in this. In the and in this case, I'm mostly talking about the Southern Murray Darling Basin, but it's basin wide. So we could deliver environmental flows from the big systems like the Goulburn River, the Murray itself, through the Mid Murray Edward McCool, the Murrumbidgee downstream of major storages, and the Lower Darling Barker. And we could use those flows for benefits within those rivers in the floodplains, as well as to connect them up and do the look after the system right through to the Murray mouth. And we're able to do that with a range of tools that are enabled under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and the Water Act. So I like this map, it's from the Living Murray, which is the second largest environmental water program in Australia. Uh, but another way to look at the system uh, is this map. And oh, I'm changing my notes, but not the slide, here we are. Is this map here, which is the same Southern connected Murray-Darling Basin, but it's shown with all the locks, weirs and storages and so you can see when we talk about a regulated river system, all these locks and weirs, dams, irrigation areas, it is a, it is a system that has a highly modified uh, since the early 1900s. Um, and when you see some of these storages here, uh, you know, they're big volume storages. So Hume Dam, 3,000 gigalitres. Dartmouth Dam, just upstream of it, nearly 4,000 gigalitres. Lake Burley Griffin is 33 gigalitres. These are, they're quite large storages. So a heavily modified system, but we've been able to recover water for the environment to try and restore some of those seasonal flows that these rivers need uh, to survive. I guess in all those time in those federal agencies, I'd spent my time out looking at the rest of this sort of Southern Murray-Darling Basin. I never looked really much at how our river up here actually works, which is still in the Murray-Darling Basin. And so I was going out to all these uh, different communities along the river saying, this is how your river works. Here's who opens the dam, here's who orders the water, here's why it changes at different times a year. So then coming up here, then becoming the community member going, how the hell does our river work? Who opens the dam? Who owns the water? Do we have environmental water? Are the rules the same? Uh, and we found, oh, actually, this was, this was the moment for me where I had that realisation, where I actually didn't understand how our own river on our doorstep works. I thought, hang on, based on everything I know about what's happening in the rest of the Murray-Darling Basin and what we're trying to do there, this really shouldn't happen. And it shouldn't happen in such a high part of the country either. So I then started to try and learn, okay, how does this thing work? And the first part of that journey, uh, this is where I started to interact with groups like the Upper Murrumbidgee Catchment Network and the Restoration Centre, was to go and see a couple of forums. 
The first one in 2021 was just held down at Namadji Visitor Centre, and that was about the ecology. What's the changes in flow meant for the ecology of the river and what condition is it in now? And what I learned there is that there are things like silver perch, now considered locally extinct, two-spine blackfish, if not locally extinct, very close. Major age class gaps of concern in yellow belly populations, concerns about platypus, rakali, crayfish. The list went on. Each presenter got up and said, oh, and here's this species and here's what the issues are. Um, the last couple of years, Murray Cod seemed to be doing well in the Bidji. So, I mean, that's a positive, but I also wonder if you've got a really good population of apex predators, what's it sort of feeding on? But um, the second part there is this Water Quality and Security Forum that was held by the UNCN in 2022. And I learned a couple of really key things about this uh, at this forum, and that's all available online. The first is that the Upper Murrumbidgee is factored into Canberra's drinking water supply. So after Cotter, after Gugong, Icon Water are actually factoring having a healthy and flowing Upper Murrumbidgee in times of dry to supply our, our water from our taps. So that's a, a term under the basin plan, critical human water needs. Um, the second part is some of the concerns around water quality that we're seeing in the river as well. And so the ACT government has raised concerns about the turbidity that's coming down and the bacteria load. So they're having to close the river, uh, particularly in summer for elevated bacteria. So not only are we worried about water quality, but actually the security as well. And I started to really click, hang on, this is, there's something different up this part of the system from what I was learning from other parts of the basin. But I'll just, I've just thrown this slide in to just give a bit of an indication of what are we talking about upstream when we're talking about the regulation of the headwaters of the upper Murrumbidgee. And so that dam there, that's our Tantangra Dam. Capacity is about 250 gigalitres. All of ACT's water storage, Cotter Catchment, Gugong is 270 gigalitres. So this is nearly the same capacity as our total ACT storage. Uh, this dam is really good at what it does. After, after three wet years, I don't think it got over 40% full. It captures water very effectively, uh, up to 90 to 99%, if not 100% of flows. Oh, actually, yeah, almost 100% of flows. This dam is very good at what it does. There is a small outlet. It's hidden behind this little wall down here that can let out a small amount each day. So three wet years, all the other storages are spilling across Southern Australia, and this one doesn't get to 50%. So why is that? Because of this map on here, the water is captured in Tantangra, sent over here to Eucumbeen, and then from Eucumbeen, it can sort of go in three different directions. It can go back into the Murrumbidgee down here through Tumut, it can go down the Snowy, or it can go into the Murray. So the headwaters of the upper Murrumbidgee are taken off the top and rerouted inland. And that's, that's what this dam was designed to do. That's... I just wanted to sort of give that context as to what's happening at the top. I think, no, I won't go into that today. There's a few things, I could, yeah, a few places I could go with this, but I'll just leave that for now. Um, so the Tantangra Dam was built in the 60s, and you can see that noticeable step change in the flows uh, downstream of Tantangra, as you'd expect from putting a really effective dam in place. I guess what we're seeing more and more now is with two quite substantial droughts. We've had the millennium drought, and then we had the 2017 to 2019 drought. And while that was shorter in duration, that was really pronounced for the heat it generated, the evaporative losses, and it really caught uh, a range of agencies right across southeastern Australia off guard. So we chat to the Icon Water, the folks at Icon Water, and with the enlargement of Cotter, they'd sort of anticipated we wouldn't need water restrictions for another 20 years. By the end of 2019, they were considering we might need water restrictions, restrictions within 12 months. That's how quickly that changed. And so this is why you know, Max and I are doing what we can to get around to say, hey, this is a you know, magnificent river right on our doorstep and it needs a bit of help. And also needs to look at how do we improve this situation to have better flows for the river and for our communities that rely on it? Um, I think we've covered a few of these, but 
when you're taking 90 to 99 percent out of the flow of the flows out of a river system you know over 50 60 years you know we're really starting to see some of these and we have seen them for a while some of these impacts ecologically culturally socially uh having quite significant impacts uh there's not enough water for the environment itself and the water that is released is not actually protected now this is a real difference with the rest of the murray darling basin where environmental flows are protected in our system if they're released they can be taken out at the first stop uh I recognise there's efforts by New South Wales government to change this, uh, but we're just keeping an eye on it. Uh, Max has covered the governance is complex as anything, so uh, I'll get into that in a sec. Um, I'll just jump straight to the last point, which is that many of these issues have been documented for a while. Sustainable Rivers Audit 2008, fish in very poor condition. There's documents back in the 1990s about the lack of flows and what it may mean for the ecology. So. I guess there's a bit of a sense of frustration in us in us as well where we're continuing to just document the decline of a river with no obvious answers as to how we uh, solve it. But we have some answers, which is great. Now, this is the messiest slide I've got for the day, so just bear with me on this one. But I've mentioned the governance is pretty complicated. So I've broken three bits of... There's three bits of legislation at play for the Upper Murrumbidgee. So on the left-hand side there, you've got the New South Wales Water Management Act. So importantly, under the Basin Plan, the states still have control over the water. The water sharing plan that sits underneath that is supposed to protect that water, and that's the instrument we're trying to get changed to protect environmental flows. Now, the New South Wales issues its licence to Snowy Hydro, which is under the Corporation, the Snowy Corporatisation Act. Now, that licence includes what it needs to do for the environment and the the rules and the amounts of water that come out of that, and bear with me on this one, come out of that document second from the bottom called the Snowy Water Inquiry Outcomes Implementation Deed. It's one of the worst named documents I've ever seen, but it's, you know, just for trying to communicate that it is actually a really significant document because that sets out how much water is available for the environment and the rules around its use. And importantly, you'll see that was set in 2002. It hasn't been updated since, and it never will be unless we ask for it. There's no standard statutory review points for those rules. And that's what we're trying to push for. The final one at the bottom there is the statement of expectations from shareholders. So just like the Commonwealth Bank or Rio Tinto, shareholders can go and you know, tell the board, here's our expectations. So for Snowy Hydro, there's only two shareholders we have to worry about. The Minister for Finance and the Minister for Energy. Senator Katie Gallagher and Senator, uh, sorry, Minister uh, Chris Bowen. So I think it is advantageous that one of them is an ACT senator because it's her drinking water as well. It's her river as well. Finally, I've got the Commonwealth legislation over there on the right, the Water Act 2007 and the Basin Plan underneath it. Now, the Basin Plan has a statement early on that says, sorry, the Water Act, the Basin Plan is not to be inconsistent with the snowy water arrangements. So it sort of says, hey, we've already got these rules here in green. We don't want to do anything that's inconsistent with them. The rules in green are set in 2002, haven't been looked at since, won't get looked at. So we're kind of stuck in this, this place, this weird place where our river's sort of set in 2002 and the rest of the Murray-Darling Basin is trying to look after critical human water needs uh, the environment, culture, social values, engaging with communities. And that's why we've turned it to the Forgotten River, because it does just fall through the cracks. Now, that licence, the Snowy Water licence in particular, that gets reviewed every 10 years, and it did in 2007. So, sorry, 2017. Now, two things ruled out of scope in that review. Is there enough water for the environment and town water supplies? Two pretty big things that you'd think you want to review. So that's the one review that's happened in, in that time. And the next one's 2027. So we really want to be prepared for that. This is the area we're focusing our attention. We want to chat to the shareholders, the two ministers, and get their expectations. You can read the current one online from the previous government. It's power uh, and finance. And that's, that's it. I should make the point. Snowy Hydro are operating in the rules that they're, they're given. 
I'm not, you know, they're doing exactly what they've been told to do within the rules that they've been given. But we want to ask the new shareholders, what are their expectations? Cultural values, social values, critical human water needs. Um, how do they see these things, particularly in a, in a changing climate? So that's our first opportunity. The second one is this water sharing plan I mentioned earlier and just getting that water protected. That's a really key one because it's been done sort of almost everywhere else in the Murray-Darling Basin and we're a bit behind, but catching up. Reviewing this document is key. The Snowy Water Inquiry Outcomes Implementation Deed. And that is a really key document that we want to see reviewed. Uh, but to crack that open, we need the Commonwealth and New South Wales uh, on board with that. And we've had support from the ACT government to try and get that done. And this is to inform the license review in uh, 2027. I've just chucked a couple of other review processes up there. The Water Act is supposed to be reviewed next year. I'm not sure that will happen now with the current conversations, but the basin plan in 2026. I guess what I want to say is everything else has a standard review period. Have we learned anything? Should we change anything? What's the monitoring telling us? Can we do things better? That SWEOI doesn't have that. It's just set at 2002. It's taken a while for us to get our heads around all these issues and bring them together into one location. And that's where we've brought this website together called the Forgotten River for the Upper Murrumbidgee. And what we're hoping by this website is the community can jump in, learn a bit about the river, what are the issues, what are the solutions, um, and how do we go about it? And how can you get involved? So here we've tried to capture some of the issues that Max and I have spoken about. What has this flow regime meant for these critical values? We've also gone to what steps do we need to take going forward? And this gets into some of those, you know, changing some of those rules around this, implementing best practice, implementing adaptive management, all these things we're doing elsewhere, but we're just not quite there in our patch. I guess the final thing, oh, it's not quite final yet, but it is starting to get traction. So the two articles at the top of this uh, were when the river ran dry in 2019. And so it meant a lot to the town of Tharwa because, you know, their critical water had ceased. But since then, this work we've done on the Forgotten River campaign has been picked up by you know, a couple of politicians. So Senator David Pocock, he loves swimming in the upper Murrumbidgee. So he's really actually quite passionate and committed about this cause. The ACT government is uh, well involved because it's about critical human water for the ACT and surrounding region. Um, so it is starting to get traction. I think this is my second last slide, but once you, if you take an hour, just work your way through the website, we sort of have this page then that says, well, what, what can I do from where I sit? And we say, well, learn about the issues, learn about how our river works and some of the, and some of the instruments that we need to change. Have the conversation. So University of Canberra has, you know, does some of the best monitoring in the upper Murrumbidgee. You know, have really good understanding of fish populations and crayfish populations and macroinvertebrates and everything going on up there. So you can just chat amongst your, your networks. Voice your concerns. Uh, a new space for me writing to ministers. So I encourage you, if you feel passionate about it, give it a crack. Send them a letter. Go down and visit the river and say, you know what, I've been to the river, I've learned these issues and, and I feel this strongly about it that I want to write and about uh, potentially you know, looking for some solutions in our part of the world. I think the last thing I was going to say is that there's so two things. One, it's probably never been a better time for us to have these conversations politically with the way things have lined up. Uh, I'm going to be obvious about that. We've got New South Wales Labor government and we've got a federal Labor government and uh, their commitment to do the Murray-Darling Basin reforms uh, have been quite obvious. And so we've, this has never been a better time to have these conversations. It's also important because it's our drinking water going forward. So that, that for me is the big one. I mean, I'd, I'd like to see a healthy environment. I'd like to see better cultural connection with First Nations. Something about the, the basic drinking water of the region that really just cuts through everyone and go, hang on, if we haven't looked at this and what we've learned in the last two droughts, let's crack open the rules and let's have a look at how this thing works and is the balance right between 
power generation and all the other values we're trying to manage for. The final thing I'm going to say uh, as a, a, a former student of Uni of Canberra, and I can't believe I'm actually back up here now in front of the room. When I was at uni doing environmental science, a few of us are kind of like, are we going to get a job at the end of this? Yeah, what's the go? There's never been a better time to be in this field because there's jobs everywhere and we need it as well. And it doesn't matter whether you're counting the macroinvertebrates, you know, in the lab or changing policy. <laughs> a few cheers for the macroinvertebrates up the back there. <laughs> um, you know, but it, it's really important and every piece fits together. Understanding the water quality, the bugs that are in it, the fish that are in it, the plants that are in it, how it responds to flow and what it needs is critical, especially under a changing climate. So it's also a bit of a pep talk that we need it more than ever. And um, yeah, I thought I'd just leave it at that. So thank you very much. I think we're going to take some questions now, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to steal your mic. Can I get you and Max to share that one? Yes, no worries. Yeah. So, I'd like to thank Andy and Max. That's fantastic. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. And so one of the things where I guess in the snowy micro operating environment at the moment, it's just finance and energy. And so one of the things that we're pushing for is to somehow bring environment and water in there because there's no forum for those four to sit down and say, what would changing this mean for finance, energy, environment, water? Because it ties up with the water portfolio and the basis as well. So there's no current forum, but it's something that we, we've highlighted. That's, that's a massive gap. Um, Max, for them. If I could do the sort of what we're targeting, we actually had a, a collective of us sat down and said, who's here do we have to choose? Okay, Minister for Water, Chief Minister, Opposition Leaders, Opposition Shadow Minister for Water, the Senators, House of Reps, um, Commonwealth Minister for Environment, Water, Tanya, and uh, we do know that there's been a, sorry, Minister for the Senate, um, there has been a letter from the ACT Minister for the Water to her saying, please, let's all step up. Um, New South Wales Minister for Rose Jackson, uh, Steve Wan, member from Monero, and that's that's just a small one. So we've got a whole list of who we're tapping on the shoulders. And as we've talked about, this is a multidisciplinary issue. This we've got to bring all the players to the table, but we've got to have a really strong um, set of voices out there saying this ain't right. This has to change. We have to have, we had transformative change. We need another transformative change. And one of the things is it's all tied up with the energy market. And so we've got people involved from the energy market, um, researchers helping us out. And when you get that comment, well, this just means, you know, less energy out there lady in the man or, you know, when they talk to you and, you know, if you're going to put more water down there, well, the energy since snowy wind in has changed. We've got far more renewable sources than just hydro now. Yes, our population is increasing. So the complexities, Peter, of this are enormous. But the really important thing is putting our hands up now and saying this governance that's overarching needs changing and we all we need help but from everyone to just even and in the senator's office and say, um, you're our local senator, you've got this power, you know. You won't change if you do. Big thanks to run the whole way to the end. Please sum up the time for one of us. You all have it. All the minutes are out. And we from a really appropriate talk to Lord Woodwick um, talking about our local voice. And I think we should sit home with everyone in the room who hasn't been to the Murrumbidgee to go to the Murrumbidgee this weekend. It's beautiful. Um, I'm going to ask to tell you something you already know, particularly what I'm about to say. 
So one of the reasons the Marmaduke doesn't manage to pick the plan is plan explicitly says this is the plan to manage the regulated people that's required out place. And one of the compromises that so you drive through the plan is to classify the Marmaduke as unregulated. So it's classified in the same way the wilderness strippers are, where there's no dams on, there's no water tanks. So it sort of was deliberately forced into a blue point. Do we know where that classification sits? And is there an opportunity under the review of the Murray Down the Basin plan to just get it shifted to being considered a regulated river? So this would be a problem. That would to some extent unlock a lot of these things because all of a sudden it would be a different place. Right. Yeah, so that paused on the Tantangra Dam. That's where I was like, do I get into the unregulated, regulated conversation or do I just? So yeah, so there's regulated and unregulated systems, and I guess most of the time it's used to describe, but uh, it's used to describe the licensing arrangements about how the water is delivered. So technically, under the framework, this is classified as an unregulated system, but with the with the headwater storage that captures ninety nine percent of its flows, it's probably the most physically regulated, unregulated river, mm. one of in the in the Murray Island Basin. So. When we were looking at that Water Act review in 2024, that initially flagged that may not happen now until a bit later. One of those things was to try and bring the Baha'u Murray somehow into the Murray Darling Basin framework. So, yeah, that's, I think, yes, it's a long term answer. I think the shorter term answer is to try and get that snowy document to change to actually increase the volume of water. Yeah, so always two parts to it, but yeah, no, but that's why I paused on that slide is that exact reason. I also understand in much more latent that a regulated river has a dam at the head that releases water for you to be able to take. The Tang Tang Road was never designed um, to release water for purposes, um, you know, for taking water, is my understanding. It was designed purely to grab everything it can and keep it for snowy hydro. Yeah. Are there any questions on yeah. the time? Yeah, like okay. So, do you have any idea of how much of the so the water gets diverted by Tantangra? What percentage of that goes to hydro versus explicitly goes to irrigation? So, 100% hydro. Or is it any idea? Yeah, I, I'd, my gut feel is it's 100% hydro because it goes through the power stations to the Tumut, into the Tumut River, and then it goes to irrigation downstream. So it kind of goes through the power stations on the lake. A significant point made by the Snowy Hydro guys we've been speaking to is that originally the scheme was set up for irrigation, and now the focus is on. The energy energy production, but I'd say 100% of it, if not close to, goes through the power stations on the way to the, the irrigation schemes. Okay, um, if there's no further questions, if there's people on Zoom, I'm sorry, I can't seem to get into the chat. Um, if there's no further questions, I'll get everyone to join me in in thanking today's presenters. And yeah, we're going to do that for We'll hang out for 15 minutes. If, yep, if anyone's got a question, yeah, there'll be 15 minutes to ask questions after the presentation. So thanks, everyone. And yeah. Thanks very much, Max, and have a great presentation. I know the Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Just yep, well can do. <laughs> Yeah, you guys have me around. Thank, Thank you. Far out. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, you're welcome. Perfect.
There was no uh, questions in there, but at least I'm back under the gym, the, the Zoom. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Uh, quite a bit of modified water and everything. Yeah, we just to the, the new start of the PC screen. Okay. So, yeah. 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 so